Welcome to The Connect, where we connect you to community, to culture, and to Columbus. I'm your host, Walter Collier. And I'm your co-host, Alicia Payne. And you're watching The Connect. We have an extraordinary show for you today, and we're going to be taking a look at some incredible people doing amazing things here in Columbus. And our correspondent, Neek, who is Neek on the Run, has a very important question she posed. What would you do if there was no social media? Let's take a look. Hi, this is Zaniqua and I'm at the Ohio Media School asking students how they feel if social media disappeared. Let's go see what they have to say. What's your favorite social media website today? Do you have one? Yeah, actually, I like Snapchat. Mm -hmm. I am really liking LinkedIn now. I'll go with Instagram. Snapchat. So how would you feel if there was no more social media? <laughs> well, okay. That face kind of told it all. <laughs> so as a DJ, uh, social media to me is, is a nice free, and I say that very loosely, but free way of marketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you can, I can market myself quite a few ways without having to pay to use the platform. Right. But at the same time, in a personal aspect, I don't think I would be completely broke down if I didn't have social media. Um, I think it would be great for everybody. I think society would be in a better place. It wouldn't be no competing with the next person. Um, people would be more focused on themselves and their families and their children. So I think it would be good if it went away and never came back. Well, for business-wise, I would be doomed because, you know, nobody wants to see my stuff. Right. But also, like, you know, I want to communicate with, like, my family and other people as well. So. That would be kind of, you know, messed up. So I'll be kind of panicking, a little bit scared. Well, you heard it yourself, people. Straight out of the OMS students' mouths themselves about how they feel if social media disappeared. I'm Sonequa, and this is The Connect. Um, as you can see, this question um, received several different responses. Mm -hmm. um, I can see both sides um, of this issue. On one hand, I can see the benefits to having social media, especially if you're a media personality such yes. as ourselves yes. or, if you're, or for business purposes. But then I can also see the negativity attached to social media as well when you consider things such as cyberbullying yes, and trolling. Sir. And so how would you feel if there was no social media? Well, initially I said, good, you know, we don't need social media. Right. But then I took a look at what if we didn't have social media? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have an opportunity to have a platform to broadcast ourselves, the connect, <laughs> to uh, market ourselves, right. and to and a brand ourselves. So I do see the benefit in having social media. Okay, well I can certainly, again, I can see both sides of the issue. Um, but what I didn't know is there's an actual annual no social media day. And so obviously okay. if I wasn't aware of this day, I had no chance to participate. But what about you? Have you participated in this no social media day? Now I have actually heard of it, but I've never participated in no okay. so social media day. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to it because mm -hmm. I do see the benefit in that as well because you have the opportunity to take back that time that you would otherwise spend on social media. Right. You could invest that in your family, in yourself, or in your community. So I do see the benefit of having no social media day. Right. Okay. I mean, I think it's a very interesting concept. Um, so when next year we roll around, no social mm -hmm. media day. I'll give it a shot. What about you? We're gonna do. I'm this? gonna give it a shot too. <laughs> Pinky promise All right, on that. Promise. Pinky promise. All right. So just let me know what it is, and we can work that out. And so absolutely. And so our next, um, our segment six, the six one four segment, it shines the spotlight on incredible people doing amazing things here in Columbus. Um, today we'd like to take you on this experience with a credible young man named Zane Hartshaw. And so as he tells us about his life, dealing his life and the challenges he faces dealing with autism. Alright, so I want to say welcome to the 614 Spotlight. We are so happy to have you guys. If you could just tell me your names and what it is that you do. Uh, well, my name is Zane Harshaw and I, and I play guitar. Uh, I'm Gene Harshaw, Zane's father, so a lot of times I'm just known as uh, Zane's dad. <laughs> so how did you get started playing the guitar? Well, when I was 13, I started playing guitar here. Hey, Purple Rain. So with um, Prince dying, like, how did you show your respect to him? What did you do? Well, so, a lot of, well, people from a club called and said they wanted me to play Purple Rain at the club to, mm -hmm. to honor him. So I know that you have a band called Blue Spectrum. Yep. Let's talk a little about how that got started. And uh, basically, it was just start off what we call the uh, Autistic Teen Play Date. Uh, this was been, 
uh, January, uh, what year was that? 2013. 2013. Uh, we just got him and three other teenagers on the autism spectrum together. One was a uh, guitar player that uh, that was a Special Olympics teammate. Second one was uh, was uh, from an autistic teen group up at OSU's mm -hmm. Nye Songer Center. And the fourth one came from the autistic teen group at Children's Hospital, and uh, he played drums. We just got to put them together one Saturday, and uh, it worked out. All right, sounded all right. What with the name Blue Spectrum? Well, we started out, we, we were called Spectrum, so like we just added the, the word blue to it because it because blue is my favorite color. Mm. Okay. That's it, so it was like a playing us, it was, it was a, a nod to the autism spectrum, but also playing a wide spectrum of music because he loves classic rock, R&B, blues, jazz, classic country, so it's kind of a tip to that. It was organic. So the next question would be, you mentioned autism. Can you share with me what autism is? What does it mean to have it? Okay, so autism is a developmental disorder, and it's called a spectrum because it affects people on the spectrum very different from like the low functioning end, where it may be non-verbal, may have a lot of impaired sensory issues, to more, or more high functioning, can't communicate, but have, may have difficulty with uh, social interactions, may have trouble with eye contact, may have all types of different sensory issues, where it might be textures, <coughs> lights, some that don't like to be touched. I mean, it just runs well, the gambit. I mean, a lot of times we, we say that uh, if you meet someone on the autism spectrum, you just meet somebody on the spectrum because every single person is different. So what was it like finding out that Zane was diagnosed with autism? So he was the, he was a four when he was diagnosed. We just kind of thought it was, oh, well, he was an only child at the time, so maybe uh, he was just developing slowly to talk. Um, then we was start talking, and it seemed like we went through a time period where it's like he, it seemed like he was losing his ability to speak. And so when we finally got got him tested, and uh, and it, it, they realized he had actually hit some of the markers that are the hallmarks of uh, autism. It just kind of took our world upside down. It really did. A lot of times, you know, me and my wife we get engagement. I've described it as the death of a child. It's the death of the child you thought you had. It's typically when you have a child, you think about all the things. It's gonna be just a chip off the old block. You know, things you're gonna teach them this, teach them that. They're gonna do this, and they're gonna do that, and just toddle after you and come to realize that that's not the child you have. Mm -hmm. And um, so it took finding out what his interests are, what what is what things that uh, he likes to do, try to find a way to get into his world because odds are they're not gonna go after going to your world. Mm -hmm. You know, they get very tunnel visioned. Uh, very intense focus on the things that he enjoys and mm -hmm. members of the spectrum. So a lot of times when they when they when they come across something that they really enjoy, uh, that they really are fascinated with, they just go a hundred miles deep into it. With you having the blue spectrum or you just playing guitar for fun, what are some of the things you hope to get out of? Um... Well, what I do is like it's like I'm being a good inspiration on kids with autism and adults with autism. Like, like, cause, like, if they look up to me, I just want to, like, I'm being a good example for them. To show that anybody can do this. It's not something that only people who don't have it. Yeah. And so, how do you feel playing the guitar has helped with your autism? Well, um, I get, I get nervous to speak sometimes. Like, I usually, it's hard to fit in. I'm like, like, I'm, I, I used to get painfully shy a long time ago. Even when I was back when I, when I was in school and so, and even in mornings, I, I never talk. And so, using music has allowed you to have that outlet. <laughs> I am Zane Harshaw and I'm a guitarist of Boost Spectrum. And I'm Gene Harshaw and you're watching the 614 Spotlight. Spotlight. story and what I love most about this story is that Zane didn't allow autism to um, stun his growth and impede on his greatness he took autism and made it something beautiful his life has 
just truly amazing. Right, absolutely. It's a very powerful story. And I am excited about this next story as well. Um, I had the incredible opportunity to sit down with a good brother by the name of Carlos Christian. Carlos Christian is the founder and CEO of the Starts Within organization. He's also an author. And so this man has a lot of different tools and talents um, that he's you know, putting out here in the world. And so I had a very interesting conversation with this brother. So let's take a look. Here with a special guest goes by the name of Carlos Christian. Um, he is the CEO of Starts Within Organization. Um, it is, this is a very important cause and we are excited to have him here today to speak with us in regards to this. And so we're just gonna get right into it. And so Carlos, um, just tell us about, you know, obviously the title Starts Within Organization. Um, you know, what, where did you get the title from? Let's start with that. Yeah, it starts with then. Yeah, yeah, actually where the title came from is because I said that, you know, before change can be seen externally, change must be done internally. I say that it starts within. It starts within yourself. It don't start without, it starts within. So anytime that you want to change your situation, it starts with you. And what is it that you want to do ultimately with this program, with this organization? Yeah, so the, 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 the main purpose of the Starts Within organization is actually to go inside of, of, of the penitentiaries and, and, and to get guys the information that they need so then they can adopt a mentality that does not get them incarcerated. The, the, the main thing that we do is we attack a mentality that gets people incarcerated versus attacking the system. If okay. we stop people from thinking in ways that will get them incarcerated, then guess what? They won't be incarcerated. And then ultimately, they'll be able to go back into their homes and into their families and restore the household structure. So okay. then that's the key. There's a lot of people that just attack the system. So I think it's an interesting approach that you're choosing to attack yeah. the person as opposed to just attacking the system. So yeah. I, I definitely commend Absolutely. that. But the system don't change. The system hasn't changed in years. Exactly. The system is a beast and it's right. meant to devour. So to continue to try right. to negotiate with a beast is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I, I know that's smart. So I attack the mentality. <laughs> the mentality. Like, that, uh, that's commendable, honestly. Like, I'm really glad to hear that because I have that issue a lot of times with people attacking the, the system when you'd be better off just dealing with people, individuals, yeah, and yeah, changing behavior. So, I, yeah, hats off to you, brother, for that. That's, uh, that's definitely commendable. Since you are a father and obviously you were incarcerated and you were able to make the transition from being incarcerated to being a father, you mentioned um, that, you were, that you sent your kid or your son, Candy, from your commissary, which I don't know too many dudes in prison that would do something like yeah, that, so that automatically put you in another, like, in another um, bracket of people. I would say, but and so, so you were, you maintained your relationship throughout your incarceration. Yes, absolutely. And so, but, and so, but what would you think? What do you think is the biggest challenge that a, a father would face? You know, coming home and, and you know from incarceration, and trying to reacquaint themselves in, in, back into their child's life. Yeah. So then, the greatest challenge that I say that any father would face, as far as getting into their children's lives is, is the challenge that's within them. You know, let, them telling them that they are valuable in their children's okay. lives. A lot of times fathers, they beat themselves down or, or, or they adopt other people's thought of them. Right. You see what I'm saying? And then they say, I don't have no contribution to make to my child. And then therefore their behavior matches that. So then right. they don't do all that they can do to make a positive impact in their children's lives. Mm -hmm. So when I'm incarcerated during my 10 years, it was a lot of fathers who are also incarcerated. As we know, it's, it's, it's 1.7 million fathers of minor children that's incarcerated right now and, and to, to, to 2.7 million children. Wow. Minor children has an incarcerated parent. Right. So and these are real numbers. Oh, yeah. Right. But but so many fathers inside of the penitentiary, they, they felt like that, you know, their contribution that they had to their, 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 their child was not relevant. They felt like that they didn't have nothing to contribute. But that's what they've been told by society. That's what they may be have. They, that's what they might have been told by their, their children's mothers or just and, and, and then now they start to adopt right. that, that 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 thought. And right. say, man, you know what? I don't have nothing to offer. And once you agree to not having nothing to offer to your children, you ain't got nothing to offer. Let's talk about these books also for a quick second. Um, okay. We got uh, Prison Without Bars. And so how did this book come about? It's just my, it's just my mindset and, and my mentality is inside of that book. So what's in that book is just that is, is the mindset that I needed to have to be able to become free when I was incarcerated, okay. you know, so I can be able to, to maintain my freedom. So I talk about in that book is the things that I needed to do to be able to be the father that I needed to be to my son. It's fathers that believe that they can't be fathers. And because they believe that they can't be fathers, they don't do the fatherly things, right? Because right. they don't believe 
that they can be good fathers. Right. right? Living down to expectations. Yes, you, you live in down to expectations. Mm -hmm. So then therefore what their minds is telling them is that, man, you know what, I don't have nothing to offer. So then therefore they don't offer anything. Right. Right. But negative. So then that's the issue. I tell a lot of people when I go inside of the prison or I go to talk to fathers, I tell mm -hmm. them, I say, man, you know what, if you want to keep on doing the same thing, you better get out of this room. Because I'm going to tell you some stuff that's going to put you in a position to where you have no option right. but to do different, right? So right. then that's powerful. But that's what I put inside of that book. We also got another book here, The Walking Logo, I'm Taking Back My Life. So yeah. I'm just give us a brief description as far as you know that book. This no, book okay, The Walking Logo, Taking Back My Life is saying that your life is not given. Just because you get released from prison, it's not just given to you. You, you got to take it back right. because it is still in the, in the hands of the system. So you got to take it back. So you got to do things that indicate that you are taking back your life. So in this book, what I'm talking about is how I've been able to sustain myself for the 11 years that I've been home now right. out of prison. So I did 10 years in prison. I've eclipsed my 10 year prison sentence now being home by one year because I've been home for 11. So I'm telling you all of the nuggets that I've been able to obtain during that time that I've been home. What I've gotten from all of this is that you're really a big advocate for self-accountability. Yes! Yeah, and yeah, that absolutely. is something that I completely 100,000% yes, agree with. I, I think we need more of that, absolutely. especially as males, as men, black men and specifically, but just men in general. Yeah, we need yeah. to be more accountable for our actions and ourselves and, our, and, and things that we produce, lives that we produce. You Brother, know, you dead on, Walter. Yeah, dead yeah. and so yeah, I definitely, absolutely. I think this has definitely been um, a good conversation. We definitely appreciate you coming by. Just tell the people how they can get in contact with you. Okay, yeah, they can. y'all can get in contact with me on, on Facebook. Y'all can connect with me on Facebook, on Instagram. Call us Christian on Facebook or Starts Within on Instagram. www.startswithin.com. Okay. You can go on the website. Matter of fact, just go on the website, startswithin.com, Starts and within you'll be able to see all of the links to the social media. Okay. Well, we we'll definitely again appreciate it. And um, thank you again on um, these shirts. Um, so th this brother oh, yeah. right here, he got a lot of things going on. Absolutely. He's an author, yeah. an activist, a community leader, um, you know, and a little bit of everything. He got shirts. And so are these shirts also available on the website? Yeah, absolutely. The shirts is available on the website, and if you are in the Columbus area, I will bring the shirts to you. Yeah. I appreciate you coming in with us today, brother. Look forward to seeing you around and working with you again in the future. Again, this is Mr. Carlos Christian with the Starts Within organization. Um, author, uh, make sure you go um, get the book, purchase the book, Prison Without Borders, as well as the Walking Logo, which is all along with these t-shirts and other merchandise. is all available on the Starts Within organization website. Um, again, thank y'all for tuning in. <laughs> that was a great story. Right. You can almost feel his passion coming to you off of the screen. Right, well, absolutely. So imagine what it was like to sit right next to the guy. I mean, he was very passionate. You mm -hmm. could tell he, you know, he was invested into what he was saying and the message that he's delivering. And what anyone could, even though Carlos has a story that may not necessarily be normal for others, what anyone could take from Carlos and his experience is self-accountability. Yes. And, you know, the fact that you can't change the system, you can't change others, but you can change yourself. And you have mentioned something that was so profound to me, mm -hmm. uh, a, a slogan that Mr. Carlos had, or right. Mr. Christian had. Right, well, absolutely. And so what Carlos says is information influences thinking and thinking controls behavior. I think I'm going to get that on a bumper sticker. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's very simple, but yet it's profound at very the same profound. time. And so shout out to Carlos. Shout out to you, Mr. Carlos. There is a saying that nothing is for free, but in Columbus, Ohio, there are some amazing things that are for free. One thing is health care. Yes, health care. Did you know about health care that's free in Columbus? Not free health care other than Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this story is about, this uh, powerful story is about the free clinics that are offered here in Columbus, Ohio. Let's take a look. My name is Donique Renee. If you want to know anything about health care, I'm letting you know about the Columbus Free Clinic where they offer free health assistance. That's right, free health assistance. I'm letting you know right now I spoke with one of the doctors as well with one of the students that gave me a rundown about what their clinic has to offer. Let's take a look. Absolutely. So we really pride ourselves on two services. Okay. One, we operate like an urgent care and we see cuts, sprains, colds, rashes. Okay. But we also offer longitudinal primary care. Awesome. So for diabetics, people with hypertension, people with hyperlipidemia, we'll follow them long term and treat their disease over years and years. Okay. Now, not only that, 
how many times can a person come in, like what you can say, in a month period or within a year span? Um, we try to say once a month, but we always make exceptions if they need it. Awesome. Um, so we really don't have a cap on number of visits, as much as you need. Awesome. So when it comes to, I guess you can say, if people doesn't have any insurance, do you guys have any possible way where they can get medication, any type of mm -hmm. that sort of needs? Good question. Awesome. We do. And, you know, some people come to us because we actually have a dispensing pharmacy. So we can give up to 90 days okay. of free medicine, up to uh, 40 different medicines. And we actually have on-site pharmacists who do medication therapeutic management, awesome. talk to patients about their meds, do all that kind of stuff. Um, and some patients really come to us just because some of their meds are so unaffordable. Awesome. Then I guess you can say on top of that, my last question, so we can just wrap it up here. It will be more so, as you guys can say, if you guys are a free clinic, do you get sponsors, donations, anything like that in a type of matter? Oh, I'd love to say we do it all ourselves, but the Ohio State University funds us awesome. um, to a great degree. So OSU Family Medicine gives us this clinic. The James Cancer Hospital gives us free medicine. Hmm. The OSU Laboratory Service gives us free labs. Awesome. And we get students and volunteers from all over Ohio State. That's great. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Thank you. Once again, this is Dr. Rob here. I oversee everything. It's a student-run free clinics, and I'm kind of um, like the president, if you will. And other people under me have like specific jobs. So we have a full lab here. So one person is in charge of the lab. We have an abundance of volunteers. So we have both an undergrad volunteer coordinator awesome. and a medical student volunteer coordinator. Um, we have referrals coordinators because we can refer um, to all specialties at OSU, which is really great for us because we're able to take good care of our patients. And yeah. That's awesome, Nina. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, as well, do you see, I guess you can say, a change in within the patients that come in after you get this, like, you know, engage with them and connect one on one with them? Sure. So um, the purpose of our clinic is actually not to have. Um, patients take us as like their primary care physician. Okay. We don't aim to do that, but we do have programs where patients can come here um, for continuous care. So for example, um, our pharmacy is uh, fully stocked with medications that they can give out in clinic. So if a patient gets their prescriptions from here, they can continuously come here to get more prescriptions if awesome. they're on our refill program. Um, awesome. After you come here a couple times, you can continue to get your prescriptions from here and we can be like your primary pharmacist. Um, as well, we have um, for the medical school, uh, since it's medical students who kind of run the clinic, we have a project that we have to complete for medical school called the Community Health Education Project, awesome. um, CHE. And for ours, we're doing uh, both a diabetes and a hypertension long-term kind of like an education program. Um, so for diabetes, for example, uh, a patient will come in and we'll kind of educate them about their disease, um, get them seen by a doctor, of course. Um, we can give them a glucometer so they can measure their blood glucose. Um, and we kind of check in with them. We give them like a health coach so they can, you know, if they want to start eating healthier, they have someone they can come to to talk about awesome. that That's good. Um, on a regular basis. Yeah, for sure. And we'll check in with them periodically, like as it is medically fit, to check in on a diabetes patient. I'm um, the same for the hypertension program. That's good. So those are the kind of things that we have long term for patients here. That's awesome. But we never deny anyone. If you just happen to come here a lot, we would never turn you away because you've come here too much. There's no, like, you know, you can't come here after three times. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Once again, that was Nina at the Columbus Free Clinic. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Well, I did know about free clinics. I think most of us are aware of free clinics. What most of us are not aware of are the many services that these clinics provide. I think a lot of us associate free clinics with things such as you know, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, not so much for things such as diabetes or hypertension, which are obviously important issues that a lot of us in our community faces. Yes, sir. And so I think it's very important that we are aware you know, that these clinics are providing you know, services for ailments such as these. Why do you think most people are not aware you know, of what these free clinics offer as far as services? I think the first reason that people aren't aware of the services is because they're just not knowledgeable that these free clinics actually exist. So I would say the awareness, the knowledge that they're out here, and the knowledge that they're actually free. And then I would say that there's a stigma that's sometimes associated with using free clinics. Mm -hmm. But as we see, these uh, clinics are operated by OSU, which is 
top ranking in this country. Right. So you're at a safe place when you're dealing with OSU. Right, so, right. Um, and so I think it's just about getting the message out that they actually exist, especially in the economically deprived neighborhood. They need to know that these services are there for them. Right, absolutely. And health is wealth, so it's certainly important, you know, for all our listeners, everyone watching, um, you know, take your health and take your health seriously and, you know, look up. I'm sure you can find the any local free clinic in your area. And so just do the research and again, just make sure you take care of yourself. Thank you all for joining us. Remember the Connect Connects culture. The Connect Connects community and, and the, the Connect, Connect Connects Columbus. Columbus. Make, it make it a great, it a great life. life.